Hello, and thanks for joining us. Welcome to the 2022 American Diabetes Association Living with Diabetes Ask the Expert series. Today's topic is a very interesting one, keeping your heart healthy. My name is Carla Cox, registered dietitian nutritionist and certified diabetes care and education specialist and your host for today's program. Our Ask the Expert series is all about answering questions from our listeners, so start getting your questions ready. For those of you on the phone, press star three, that star three on your keypad and an operator will collect your question and place you in a queue so that you may have the opportunity to ask your question live. To participate online, type in your name and question in the fields below the streaming player. Press the submit question button and your question will come directly to us. Stay with us through the hour and you will learn useful tips to help you live well on your journey with diabetes. In addition, we invite you to provide us with your feedback in our five question survey at the end of this program. Okay, now a little bit about why we're here today. Because of the link between diabetes and heart health, the American Diabetes Association in collaboration with the American Heart Association has launched No Diabetes by Heart. With support from founding sponsors, Novo Nordisk, as well as national sponsors, AstraZeneca and Bayer, the No Diabetes by Heart initiative provides tools and resources for people living with type two diabetes to learn how to reduce their risk of cardiovascular disease. As part of the initiative, the ADA is holding this free educational Q&A session once a month. We'll cover information and tips to help you take charge of your health. We're sorry we started a little late today, but we were having some technical difficulties. And unfortunately, um, Kim is not on to, able to get on video, but she is with us and we'll talk about her in a minute. As a public health reminder, in general, people with diabetes who get COVID face a greater challenge with maintaining glucose within target range as with any illness that they may have. In addition, if glucose levels have been elevated over time, persons also have increased risks of complications when dealing with the viral infections of any sort, and that is also true of COVID-19. The American Diabetes Association encourages all persons with diabetes to get vaccinated for COVID. If you have any questions about the vaccination, please talk with your healthcare provider. The ADA also encourages persons to follow the guidelines of the CDC and to contact your medical provider if you suspect that you are showing any signs or symptoms or have been exposed to COVID-19. For our most up-to-date information, please visit our website at diabetes.org forward slash coronavirus or call 1-800-342-2383. I am delighted to introduce Kimberly Ketter as our expert today. Mrs. Ketter is an adult geriatric nurse practitioner and a certified diabetes educator. She is a graduate of Old Dominion University and Walden University, where she earned her MSN. She's an identical twin, and along with her sister, co-owns and operates Case Management Associates, LLC, a primary care and diabetes wellness center in Petersburg, Virginia. Her primary focus is managing and educating adults with type 2 diabetes and other cardiometabolic issues, including obesity and hypertension. She also works in a local cardiologist's office with a primary focus on cardiometabolic syndrome. She is a congestive heart failure survivor of 13 years and contributes her time and experiences as a heart failure ambassador for the American Heart Association. With the 30 plus years of nursing experience, she strives to educate and empower her community. She teaches heart health and diabetes education classes regularly and continues to encourage others to live well. So it's, she's a wonderful resource for all of us. Uh, Kimberly, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Do you have kids? What's going on with that part of your life? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share and to discuss and prayerfully answer some questions and help everyone to be healthy. Again, my name is Kimberly Ketter. Um, everyone calls me Kim. If someone starts calling me by my full name, Kimberly Ann Ketter, that means I've done something wrong. That's how our moms used to do it when we were younger. If they called you and they mentioned your full name, then that was a problem. Um, again, as mentioned, I am a heart failure survivor in addition to my professional role as a nurse practitioner and as a certified diabetes specialist, education specialist. 
Um, I'm an identical twin, as you mentioned, and my sister and I were diagnosed um, with congestive heart failure at the age of 40. So one of the things that we teach and we like to share is that heart failure really doesn't know an age. It can happen at any age, and there are a lot of pieces under cardiovascular disease that many people really don't um, think about. When we hear cardiovascular disease, we think more in terms of heart attack and things like that. But there are so many different things underneath that umbrella, and hopefully we'll be able to talk a little bit about those today. But, again, heart failure survivor, doing great. I love to dance. I like to live life. And if 2020 has taught us nothing, it has told us to live life to the fullest. Even with a diagnosis, we can all live well. We just need to have the information and have to have um, just the guts to, you know, look it in the face and defeat it. There are ways that we can live better and prevent some of these things. So hopefully we'll get to talk about a lot of those things. Again, I'm really, really happy to be here today. Thanks, Kim. As we are waiting for our callers and online listeners to chime in, I'm going to go ahead and kick off with the first question. Are persons with okay. diabetes at higher are persons with diabetes at higher risk for developing heart disease, and and why is that? If they are, well, we have to take a look at what diabetes actually does. Again, diabetes basically by definition means that our bodies are either not making insulin at all or not making enough insulin. And insulin, the way that I describe it to my patients, is like the key that unlocks our blood cells. Our blood cells need to eat. Uh, I liken it to like the Pac-Man game, if everyone is aware of uh, Pac-Man back in the day. I guess we still play that now, but if you can imagine our blood cells like Pac-Man and the dashes on the Pac-Man board as sugar, we need sugar for fuel. That's how our bodies run. And all Pac-Man has to do, if you remember the game, is to go through the maze and eat the dots, right, eat the dashes. The problem with people who have diabetes is, is that Pac-Man's mouth won't open. So he essentially is not able to eat the dashes, clear the screen, and live to go to the next level. He cannot go to the next level unless he clears the screen. So basically what diabetes is, it's the cell's inability to take on sugar and take on energy. It just can't get in. And again, insulin is the key to unlock those cells, to let the sugar in to be used for energy. What happens with folks who have diabetes is, is that if the sugar doesn't have any place to go, ultimately what happens is it starts to ruin or destroy our blood cells. And the more uh, susceptible ones are the smaller blood vessels in our body. You know, they get destroyed. And think about where they are. They're behind our eyes. They're in our kidneys. And they're in our hearts, right? And they're in our, in our brains. So if those blood vessels get destroyed, blood then cannot effectively get to those organs to feed them. If those organs cannot be fed, they will die. And then we get the heart attack and the stroke and the kidney disease and the blindness from retinopathy. So I like to call it uh, diabetes a microvascular disorder because that's exactly what it is. It tries to defeat or tries to destroy the microvasculature or the small blood vessels all over our body and think about where that blood needs to go, and that's where we get some of the symptoms from having diabetes uncontrolled. I do want to mention and remind everyone that there are essentially three different types of diabetes. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, just as a reminder, type 1 diabetes, we used to call it juvenile diabetes in, uh, in the past, but they've gotten away from those those titles because we're seeing a lot of crossover. Um, but we do see type 1 generally in younger folks, but we are starting to see it in young adults in their 20s as well. And basically with type 1, your body just doesn't make any insulin at all. So most folks who are in type or all people who are type 1 have to have insulin. They usually have to inject themselves or use a pump, but they have to have insulin in order to live. The pills don't work for type 1. Type 2 diabetes has two components to it. One of the components means that your pancreas works. It makes some insulin, but it just doesn't make enough to meet the body's demands. The other piece to that is something called um, insulin resistance. And we see insulin resistance in folk who are, a, are overweight. And the rule pretty much is the more fat we have on our frame, it prevents the insulin that our pancreas is able to make from working properly. So it can't get in and open the cells and do what it does. 
That's why with type 2, it's so important to manage diet and exercise because if we can get rid of the thing that causes the insulin resistance, we can get our insulin working better and get those numbers working better and sometimes without medications if we do it well. The third one is uh, gestational diabetes, and this happens to some women when they're pregnant. They get what looks like diabetes. Some have to have insulin during pregnancy. And for many, once they deliver the baby, it goes away. It looks like they've never had it. The problem with that is is that some people remain at high risk for type 2 diabetes later on. So we encourage those who have gestational diabetes to continue to get screened and to monitor for type 2. So that's basically the connection. It, it destroys the, um, the small blood vessels in the body. And, again, if you just think about where those small blood vessels are feeding, and there you have your organ problems or your organ disease as a result of that. Thank you. That was great. If you're just joining us, welcome to today's Ask the Experts, Keeping Your Heart Healthy. As a reminder, for those of you on the phone, press star three. That's star three on your keypad, and an operator will collect your question and place you in the queue so that you can have the opportunity to ask your question live. To participate online, type your name and question in the fields below the streaming player. Press the submit question button and your question will come directly to us. Remember, today's topic is about keeping your heart healthy. So let's remember to focus on that topic for today's event when asking questions. Okay, let's take the first question. This is coming in from Jackie and Jackie is from Florida. Hello. Yes, I'm living in Florida, but I was born and bred in Richmond, Virginia, where Kimberly is. Um, I am a type 1 diabetic. I'm 84 years old. I've been a diabetic for 43 years. I have had a nuclear heart uh, test about five years ago, had no problems. Um, my um, cholesterol has been 250 for a long, long, long time, and the LDL is 184. I have, I'm not obese, I'm 5'4", weigh 150. Uh, I take very good care of my um, diabetes. My A1C level is 5.7. I do not want to have to take a statin, but do I need to? That is a great question. One thing that I do want to mention is that sometimes despite our best efforts, and it sounds like you take great care, oh, my gosh, type 1 for 43 years, that's amazing and doing as well as you're doing, so you should be congratulated on that. Some people um, with um, hyperlipidemia and cholesterol issues, there's a genetic component with that too. You know, some people um, just have high cholesterol based on their genes. And sometimes despite best efforts with diet and exercise and things like that, you still have the high um, cholesterol. Um, particularly the LDL, again, that's the one, that's the lousy cholesterol, right? We got two different, we got several components to the cholesterol. The, um, the good one is the HDL, of course, is the happy one. I'd be curious to see um, what your happy cholesterol is because sometimes if we have enough of that, it kind of helps. Um, some of the providers that I speak with um, understand sometimes it balances it out a little bit. But the LDL, the LDL um, bears watching because the LDL is the sticky one, and that's the one that can cause heart attack and stroke. Um, if you have other issues, particularly heart disease, um, along with diabetes and things like that, the recommendation is starting a statin. Uh, I understand that some people just don't want to do the statins, but um, they are recommending that because it does decrease the risk of heart attack and stroke be because of the diabetes risk and things like that. And the statins are very good with lowering the LDL specifically. So I will certainly have a conversation with your provider about the pros and cons. Some of my patients that I speak with, uh, we have we come to the bargaining table. You know, sometimes if I get a uh, cholesterol panel that I'm not particularly happy with, um, they'll say, well, give me a little bit of time. Let me work on it a little bit. You know, let me get, um, you know, some vitamins in. Let me get some more exercise in. Let me do everything that I can. And let's check it again in a few months, and I'm okay with that. But if that's been the case and it's been hanging out, you know, above the norm, because remember, LDL should be less than 100. That's the ultimate goal. Anything over that um, increases your risk for cardiovascular uh, disease and risk. Um, so if you've tried everything and those numbers are still not correcting, um, I will certainly speak with your doctor about starting a statin. They may start with a low-dose statin. Um, but it certainly will help with your risk for cardiovascular disease and problems down the road, I believe. 
Thank you. Um, we have a question coming in from Amy. Amy's from Salem, Massachusetts. Hi. Um, I was wondering, um, are diabetics more prone to congestive heart failure and that kind of thing than other people? That's a great question. The risk for general cardiovascular disease is greater in folks who have diabetes. Specifically speaking with um, congestive heart failure, um, I would probably say yes, that is true as well. And the reason for that, a lot of people who have congestive heart failure, what happens to them, um, they get the heart failure from an MI or from a blocked blood vessel. So basically what congestive heart failure means is that the heart is not able to pump blood sufficiently to move the blood through the body and meet the body's demands. So it's essentially a weaker heart, right? It doesn't squeeze and move the blood like it's supposed to. What causes that? There are a lot of things that cause that. Some, for example, with my heart failure, they have no idea why I have heart failure. I don't have coronary artery disease. I don't have hypertension. I don't have anything, but I do have heart failure. They think it's probably a genetic piece of mine because my identical twin has it. For a lot of people who have a heart failure that I see, there's a coronary artery component to it, meaning that they've had a heart attack that has damaged the main pumping mechanism of the heart so it doesn't work as well. So, and they are also diabetic. So remember what I said earlier. Remember, diabetes is a microvascular disease, and it has a tendency to become laser-focused on those smaller blood vessels, and our smaller blood vessels are, are in our heart and in our brains and in other places. So if those small blood vessels of your heart um, get clogged up or get destroyed, that part of the heart muscle cannot get oxygen and supply the heart muscle. And that heart muscle then will die. If that heart muscle dies, that portion of the heart will never pump again like it's supposed to, resulting in congestive heart failure, if that makes sense. So it, you are at higher risk for um, heart failure, for CAD or, or coronary artery disease with diabetes, absolutely. That's why prevention is so very important. A lot of these things could be prevented and adequately controlled if we just um, really take note and just really take the bull by the horns and, and make that happen. Great. We have an online question coming in from Sam. What are the best things a young adult with type 1 diabetes can do each day to ensure a, heart, a healthy heart later in life? Probably the best thing and the most, and one of the most important things um, to do, and um, at the Cox, you can probably attest to this as well, is monitoring. We can only fix what we acknowledge, right? So monitoring those blood sugars is vital. And I know, you know, particularly for type 1 diabetics and for type 2 as well, you know, it, is, it can be burdensome at times, you know, and it can be overwhelming at times. But the more that we're aware of what our bodies are doing and what our blood sugars are doing, the better and the more controlled we can keep those numbers, the less chance you're going to have for cardiovascular disease further down the road. In addition to controlling blood sugars and taking medications and um, even speaking with your um, diabetes specialist about pump adjustments and things like that, um, diets are certainly important as well. Now, with type 1 diabetics, um, Certainly with type 1 and type 2, diets are important, of course, um, but the, we look at them a little bit differently. We view them through a little bit of a different lens because, remember, type 1s basically aren't making the insulin. We just have to replicate what the pancreas is supposed to be doing. So, But we still um, encourage our patients who are type 1 and type 2 you know, to monitor their carbs. Um, they get plenty of rest, get plenty of rest. Stress is a, um, an underlying factor of high blood sugar, so we encourage people to control the stress that they have in their life. You know, take some self-care time, do some me time, make sure you're taking good care. Make sure you're taking good care if you become sick. So, for example, if you have a viral infection or some other type of infection or a cold, you have to understand that sometimes people's blood sugars will get elevated during that time and have to make those adjustments. So I think, again, probably one of the most important things to do to prevent heart disease down the road as a type 1 diabetic 
is to really stay on top of managing earlier on so that we can prevent those things from happening in the first place. And, again, monitoring uh, with the CGM or the finger pricks, if that's what you're doing. And certainly the A1C is one of the markers that we use, and to keep those within normal limits is vital. Uh, we just have to stay on top of those things. Great. So I have another question that kind of adds on to this, um, how to prevent heart problems later on. And that comes in from Kevin. And his comment is, how important is exercise? Oh, gosh, exercise is vital. A body in motion stays in motion, right? So our bodies are designed to move. Our bodies are not designed to be stagnant. They're, they're these wonderfully God-given equipped machines, right? You know, and we have to keep them moving. You know, the best of machines only work well when you run them from time to time. If you think about that, classic automobile in a driveway, if you don't run it for a long period of time, it's probably not going to start up very well, right? Our bodies are the same way. Our bodies need exercise. We need to get good oxygen in our lungs and move that oxygen around in our blood and move those muscles. That helps with our diabetes as well, as well as heart disease, because it helps with managing cholesterol. It helps to manage and keep the blood sugars down. The more exercise, the more sugar we burn the more control we have over that. It helps greatly with hypertension. It helps to manage our blood pressure. Um, going for a walk, going on a run, riding a bike, getting to the gym, it not only helps us physically to keep everything going, but it helps us mentally as well. There's a lot going on in the world right now, right? And there's a lot of stressors and so much going on. We got to take better care of ourselves. And exercise is a good outlet for stress and, you know, to disconnect from the worries of the world for a little while and just focus on ourselves for a while. So exercise is vital. The recommendation is to get 30 minutes of aerobic exercise most days of the week. For my patients, I say if they haven't been doing anything at all, we start with at least three days. So my, um, uh, what we try and get them to do is like commit to three days a week for me. Give me Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. 30 minutes for three days, find something that you enjoy. You know, if you don't like walking on a treadmill, don't walk on a treadmill because you're not going to commit to do it. I hate walking on a treadmill. It feels too much like a stress test to me. <laughs> so I don't like to do that. I like to walk. I do like to walk in the park, you know, so to add a little something to my exercise regimen, I'll get hand weights. And I'll run, I'll walk with those. Or I'll get ankle weights. It adds a little bit more to my exercise regimen. I like to dance. I love to dance. And it's great aerobic exercise. You burn a lot. And you don't have to go anywhere. Usually what I'll tell my patients is if this is something that you like to do for exercise, get, you could go to like um, one of the, you know, $5 stores or someplace like that and get an aerobic step, get you some hand weights and stand in front of your television or stand in front of your computer and go on YouTube and Google your favorite music videos. If you go up and down that step at a good clip through six or seven videos, you'll get pretty close to that 30 minutes. And I'm almost willing to bet that if you do that and you're focused on the music and you're singing and you're dancing to your favorite song, you won't even think about it being exercised for 30 minutes. That's how I get through it. There are a lot of ways to do it, but the key is to find something that you enjoy. It is vital for heart health and it's vital for diabetes management. Thank you. You know, I think another thing that's come out of um, all of our research on diabetes and exercise is that the gold standard is 150 minutes uh, a week, which is the 30 minutes, five days a week, but also just mm -hmm. getting up and moving every hour. So you just don't, you, you're sedentary all the time. So if you feel like you can't get out and walk for whatever reason, some physical issues that you're having, at least get up and move around a bit. Um, and then if you're having some knee problems, back problems, see a physical therapist and they can design a program for you because as Kim says, it's critical really that we all get some movement in so that we can continue to move. Otherwise we become, uh, unable to do the, do even the things for just uh, tasks of daily living. Exactly. Okay, Some of my patients, I even recommend pool therapy as well. Oh, yeah, you that's great. Right. Yeah, 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 get to the YMCA and do some aerobic classes in the pool. It's great on the joints. 
And if you're That's at a- home working from home, get a stand-up desk and work that way so you're not sitting for eight hours. Those are just some other um, tips. Yeah, those are great. And the recumbent bike is another one that a lot of people with with knee injuries, for example, can get on a recumbent bike. And that's another good one. Okay, so Ronnie, Ronnie uh, has a question for us. Yes, uh, my husband was recently diagnosed with diabetes. And although we eat what I consider a healthy diet, I feel a little overwhelmed at trying to find the right foods, how many carbs, how many, um, what the sugar count is, uh, a little advice would be really appreciated. Those are great questions. One thing that I do mention to my patients as I teach them, certainly there are basic guidelines, but diabetes management, particularly with on the uh, speaking about nutrition, there's not a one-size-fits-all. It's not cookie-cutter. Everybody is very different. That's why diabetes self-management education and speaking with a specialist is so vital, particularly one-on-one. One of the things that we do is really get to know our patients and what they're eating. So one of the things that we ask them to do is to keep a meal journal and journal down what they're eating every day and bring it into their visit so that we can take a look at it and find out what they like. And then we talk together to try and figure out, well, how many carbs should we really be getting? The carbs generally... um, generally should be between 45 grams to 60 grams per meal. Now, there's a range because it depends on the goals of the patient. What are the weight loss goals and things like that? What are your lifestyles? How much are you exercising? Are you an athlete? So, for example, if you're an athlete, of course, you're going to burn up a lot, so you could probably take on a lot more carbohydrates. But if you're sedentary, we like to stay on the low end of the carbohydrate count. When you're looking at a nutrition label, um, I heard her mention sugar in her question. Sugar's not the complete answer, and a lot of patients that I even talk with um, go straight to looking at sugar to determine, you know, if I can have this for my diabetes or not, but it's not the whole answer. It's the carbohydrates that we really need to be looking at. It's the total carbohydrate. Sugar is a carbohydrate, so they've included that number actually in the total carbohydrate number. So it's the total carbs that we need to be getting. Remember, carbohydrates are anything pretty much made from a grain, so that's going to be your flour and your wheat and your corn, potatoes, anything made from those things. So it's cereal, it's fruit, anything with natural sugars. So if you think of it this way, if you have um, a sugar-free cupcake, for example, it says, you know, sugar-free, and my patients will often come in and say, well, it says sugar-free, so I had five of them. I thought it was fine. Well, no, there's still flour in there and some other things, which are carbohydrates. You have to look at the total carbohydrate. So, again, to your question, a general range is between 45 and 60 grams of carbohydrate, depending on weight loss goals and depending on activity. Um, You certainly want to make sure that you're looking at the sodium on the label as well. It's also equally important since we're, again, talking about the connection between diabetes and heart disease. The amount of sodium that you should be getting in a day is 1,500 milligrams for most people because most people have hypertension, have heart disease, have diabetes, and that sort of thing. It should be about 1,500 milligrams per day. That's nothing. You know, if you go and look at some of the things that you have in your cabinet, particularly anything that is processed in a can, ready for the microwave, or ready to eat out of a box, you got to be suspicious about sodium because it's Something's preserving it. So you want to be careful with that. Um, Some other questions um, around carbohydrates we get a lot is, are fruits okay? Of course fruits are okay. We want you to have those things. You just have to be careful of the amount. It's not what you eat all the time that gets you in trouble. It's the amount and sometimes the time of day. So an, another piece to this all is that um, I think if you look at the plate method, that may be a good place for you to start since you feel like you're getting a little overwhelmed. So um, right. things like making sure, you know, a quarter of the plate is protein, a quarter of it is a starch, and then half of it is vegetables, lots of vegetables. So I think that's another way of addressing this. And um, Kim mentioned earlier that diabetes education uh, programs are great. I certainly encourage you to see a dietitian. 
but diabetes education programs provide services that focus on all your diabetes. And you can um, contact the American Diabetes Association and they can tell you whether there's a program near you. You can call your local hospital. You can um, Google it and see where diabetes education programs might be close to you. But I, I really encourage you, particularly when you're newly diagnosed or transitioning from, for example, teenagers to college or um, you get a new diagnosis, it really would be good for you to see um, a diabetes educator. So um, here's adding to this is another good question coming in from Clarence. Clarence from Atlanta. Hello. I'm calling because I am not only a diabetic, but I also am in uh, congestive heart failure. And I was, I was concerned about what fruits and vegetables I can lean on heavily because I am still, although I've lost a lot of weight, I'm still concerned with losing even more. But uh, I was wondering if you could help me with that. What uh, uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, raw and cooked, should I lean on? That is a great question. Um, fresh, I tell my patients, fresh is always best. Frozen next, canned last. Um, any things that are from the ground, from the vines, and from the trees are always going to be great options. Um, what we do recommend is that you lean a lot on the non-starchy vegetables, so your leafy greens like your kale and your collards and your broccoli and your uh, string beans and your cauliflower and things like that. Fruits really depend on the patient. Um, you really, I usually tell my patients they have to sometimes see how they're going to react with their body. As a general rule, I tell my patients the tropical fruits sometimes will get their blood sugars um, pumped up. So those are like your bananas and your pineapples and your mangoes and things like that. Now, grapes will also get those blood sugars up. You want to get those that are high in fiber, and I usually encourage the fruits to have the peel still on them. So your apples and your pears are really good. The more fiber that you have, your body has a tendency to turn that into sugar more slowly, so you don't get as high of a blood sugar spike when you eat those. You want to be careful with the fruits, particularly in the little fruit cups. They're all not bad, but you want to make sure if you're going to do those, make sure you shoot for the ones that have no sugar added, or they'll say something like packed in their own juices, and stick to the serving size. I have some of my patients who say, well, I've just been eating you know, what you told me, you know, in the little serving cups with no sugar added, but I had three of them. Well, the serving size is one, <laughs> okay? So, and then you want to make sure that you're staying within the serving size to make sure your blood sugars don't spike. But your non-starchy vegetables are good. Potatoes are not completely off limits. Um, I do tell folks that um, the sweet potato, for example, is a little bit better for you because it's got more fiber in it. I also tell folks that they're going to do potatoes shoot for the colorful ones, so like your purple potatoes, your red potatoes, even your yellow potatoes, and leave the peel on them and kind of roast them in the oven. You can roast them with different vegetables. Some people like to roast them like with um, Brussels sprouts and things like that. All those are great. I do encourage colorful portions to your plate. As Dr. Cox mentioned before, um, half of your plate should be your non-starchy vegetables. It shouldn't look like a desert. So, you know, you should be really colorful. So lots of green, lots of yellow, peppers are great, carrots are great, things like that. Onions are fantastic. So, again, it's not necessarily what you're eating all the time. It's the amount and the time of day. Another tidbit that I mentioned to my patients is try to avoid eating a lot of fruit before you go to bed because what you might find is that when you wake up in the morning, your blood sugars are over, over their goal. So you want to make sure that you're eating them early enough in the day so that you can burn that extra sugar off and still get the nutrients. So, again, fresh is always better, frozen next, canned is last. If you have to do canned, get the no sodium added. And I still tell folks to rinse them off. You know, you pop the can, put it in the colander, and rinse them off so that you get some of those preservatives off. So get them however you can, but vegetables, 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 very good for you. Beets are good for blood pressure, too, by the way. You know, I think your advice is great because I think we concentrate so much on the quantity of carbohydrate 
And it can be pretty much like you said, look like a desert. It can pretty much be just brown and white. And it's really important to look at the quality of the food, not just the quantity. So you did a, a great job with that. We have a question coming in from Patrick. Patrick, you're on the line. Hello, how are you? I'm here. Good. <laughs> Hello. Is he there? Is Patrick, he there? you're on the line. Yeah. What is your, what is your question? Uh, I'm uh, 82. Uh, I've been diagnosed about 30 years ago with uh, type 2. Uh, my A1C ranges between uh, 6, 4, and 7, 3. Um, I uh, lost 80 pounds, uh, and I, uh, I walk every day, and I ride my stationary bicycle every day, and I lift weights four times a week. And uh, I've now uh, when I check my blood sugar levels with my meter, uh, about 25% of the time I'm getting normal readings. And I'm wondering, is it possible for me to uh, go into uh, remission on type 2 diabetes, or am I stuck with this for the rest of the time? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I'm really, I'm really, really careful with saying that patients have been cured of diabetes. I'm very careful about saying that. Um, it is my opinion that once you have that diagnosis, you pretty much have that diagnosis. However, with that said, there are a lot of patients that we see who have A1Cs and it represents a non-diabetic patient. They are completely diet and exercise control, which means they have an A1C of less than that 5.7, so it doesn't even look like they have it. Um, so we can certainly do that, but what I usually will call that is a diet control type 2 diabetic. Um, I'm very careful to say cure. For me, cure would mean that I can give you those cells back in your pancreas that have died and no longer produce insulin, if that makes sense. So um, can this be reversed, and can we get you to where it looks like you don't have diabetes at all, and can you, you know, live a completely healthy life off of medications just with exercise and diet? Absolutely, absolutely. But again, I'm really cautious to say you have been cured with diabetes. I don't think anyone is really saying that right now. Yeah, and I think too, um, you've had this for quite some time. And you know, about 50% of persons with diabetes go on to need insulin not because they've been naughty and not paying attention, but because that's the physiology and the progression of diabetes. So you've done an amazing job. I don't know what amount of medications you're on, but chances are you may just have to struggle with um, having it, um, but you're doing a great job maintaining it, and those A1Cs are great. Um, I have a question coming in from Shunden on um, the email. Um, a really good question. Um, diets are hard, especially if you have food insecurities in rural areas, no running water mm. or electricity. How can we support diets in our patients if they don't have these on hand? That has been, that whole issue has been a thorn in my side for a long, long time. Um, the area that I actually work in in my clinic is actually in the middle of a food desert as well. And it's very difficult for me to make recommendations about, you know, healthy eating, get your fresh vegetables, you know, and this and that, if there are no grocery stores within walking distance for a lot of my patients. So it is difficult when you live in a uh, food insecure area. There are different ways that you can do it, though. Um, there, I would, I would probably recommend if there are like farmers markets. Sometimes in some of these areas, there are farmer's markets that you can get to. I'm not sure what the transportation issue, you know, is or how far you might be from someplace like that. But for some of my patients, I recommend go to the farmer's market and they can just, you know, when they have um, the means to do so, get as much of that as they can. And you can always freeze it. You can always cut them up and put them in your freezer and that way you are. So that way, you know, you don't have to go like every week to a grocery store or something like that. Again, frozen veggies and things like that are okay. Fresh is always better. Um, what we try and discourage is the whole corner store things, you know, because they really don't have adequate healthy foods. They just don't. So it's very difficult. Um, I would probably recommend uh, farmer's markets. 
Um, some areas do have different food delivery programs that you might be able to tap into. Um, for example, like if you're qualified for things like um, Meals on Wheels and, you know, some other things like that, I'm not sure of the area, um, but there may be some um, delivery services in your area that can deliver fresh, healthy foods and things like that. So I would tap into some of your local resources. Um, social services maybe might be able to help with some of that as well. But a lot of my patients have been able to find, uh, like, farmer's markets and just buy a bunch of things and then stock their freezer. That way they have those fresh vegetables for a long period of time. Thank you. And in, in discussing heart disease, how often do you recommend people with diabetes get their lipids checked? Generally speaking, we like it at least once a year. More frequently, if you're on medication to control your cholesterol or if they're making adjustments. So, for example, um, if I have a patient who I've just put on a statin, I want to see them back and check that in about three months because I want to know if the medication is working. If you have no issues, no heart disease, no diabetes or anything like that, usually once a year um, is, is sufficient. Um, but again, more frequently, depending on medications that you're taking and how um, how your numbers look, it just really varies depending on the patient. But as a general rule, about every three months, if they're making adjustments, if it's well controlled, somewhere between six months and a year is adequate. Thank you. And this kind of follows right in there. It's from Peggy online. Should a person see a cardi cardiologist yearly if they have type 2 diabetes? I'm going to say not necessarily. It depends on what else is going on. Now, if you have some cardiovascular disorder, absolutely. So if you have heart failure, if you've been diagnosed with a heart attack or coronary artery disease or anything like that, you absolutely should be seeing a cardiologist, I think, at least once a year to monitor things, particularly with heart failure because you want to make sure that the uh, what we call the ejection fraction or the heart function of the heart is is stabilized, that it's not getting any worse. Remember, diabetes and type 2 diabetes in particular can be a progressive thing, and for some people can get worse over time. So you have to figure if your diabetes can get worse over time, you've got to keep your eye on the things that it affects the most, and it affects the heart, it affects the kidneys, it affects the eyes. So in addition to getting to see a cardiologist at least once a year, if everything is stable, again, more frequently if you've got some stuff going on, um, we should also be watching the kidneys and getting to the eye doctor for eye exams and, and that sort of thing as well. So, yeah, if you don't have any coronary artery disease, completely normal EKG, absolutely nothing going on, probably, you know, once a year or as needed. But if you've got any of the diagnoses that we talked about, you really should be seen at least once or twice a year, I would imagine, more frequently depending on severity. Thank you. So this question comes in from Gloria, and I, I'm not sure if it's wishful thinking or if you could give her an answer, but uh, Gloria, you're on the line. I'm, excuse me. I am concerned about um, sugar spike. I like cake, and I've been told that when you eat something sweet, then you have protein behind it, and that will kind of keep the sugar from your spikes from going up high. I need to know if I do eat something sweet, what to do behind it. Well, that's a great question. I do not think that eating protein behind a sweet is going to kind of trump what the carbohydrate is doing. It just doesn't really work that way. Protein is, you know, we, we like to tell our patients, you know, to get more lean proteins in. It helps, helps with the blood sugar control, but it doesn't trump the cake. So what, we, what I usually recommend for my patients is there's really nothing off limits that I tell my patients. There's nothing off limits. The only thing I tell my patients you got to give up for me is soda. Now, if you want a slice of your grandchild's birthday cake on their birthday, I tell them, please have the birthday cake. Make adjustments. Do it not before you go to sleep. Don't go to sleep on it. Have a small piece. Portion size is, is, is important, right? So don't get, you know, a quarter of the cake, you know, get a, a reasonable size piece of cake. Take the icing off and don't have ice cream with it, you know. And after you do those things, go for a walk. 
you know, if after the party, after your grandkids' birthday party, and you have, you know, a piece of cake, go walking with your grandkids, you know, around the block, or go play with them in the backyard with yard games. Because what that's going to do is going to help burn up that carbohydrate and burn up that sugar, so you don't see as much of a spike afterwards. So that's probably one of the most important things that you can do. Don't go to sleep on heavy carbs like that. And if you want to indulge in some of those things, because I'm a, I'm a lover of life. You know, we live life, right? Make sure you're getting it probably when you're most active during the day. You know, if you know you're going to go to the gym, you know, later that in the afternoon around 3 o'clock and you want a piece of cake, you know, after lunch, have your little piece of cake at 1 o'clock. You know you're going to burn it off when you go to the gym. And you, hopefully, you know, you won't see those blood sugar spikes. But any carbohydrate, um, two hours postprandial or two hours afterwards, um, you're probably going to see, you know, a bit of a spike depending on the medications you're using and all of that. So to your question, protein in and of itself, eating it behind a piece of cake is not going to trump the cake. The cake is just going to do what cake does. The protein is going to do what protein does. Thanks. You know, another thing exercise does that's pretty cool is not only do, are you using up glucose as you're exercising, but you're using your insulin more effectively. So right. um, yep. earlier mm -hmm. And the, the idea of insulin and there are more places to put the key when you exercise. So right. um, that's another right. way that it works really well. Yeah. So here's a question mm -hmm. that I think you can answer in regards to heart disease as well. And this comes in from Patsy, um, Patsy from North Carolina. Hello? Hi, Patsy. Hi. Hi. Um, my question is, I have type 2 diabetes, and my doctor has suggested weight loss surgery. And I'm really considering it because I need to lose a whole bunch of weight. And I was thinking, you know, uh, uh, what's your opinion about it? Well, I think it is a viable option for some patients. Um, particularly if the risk of heart disease and hypertension and and those type of things are really great. I don't take it lightly, though, because it is surgery, and there are different types of that surgery. There's bypass surgery, of course, and some patients opt to get the sleeve and, you know, different things like that. But they all pretty much are designed to do the same thing. You know, they shrink your stomach down so that you can't put as much in it. And a lot of patients, I have actually have several patients who have had the surgery done, who have had the sleeve, and they're doing quite well, actually, and they no longer require diabetes medications. With that said, again, I tell my patients when they start on the journey to make sure they understand that once you have that surgery or once you, you know, have the sleeve, it is a lifelong changing thing. You know, it's not something that you just have the surgery and then everything goes back to normal your complete diet and your lifestyle changes forever. And you have to stick and maintain a very tight diet along with some other instructions that they would give you. But it does help with that, um, the insulin resistance piece, right? Because if you lose all of the weight, then you give your insulin that you are still producing a chance to do its thing. So in that essence, it is a good thing. What I do tell folks to do though, and to expect, is that when they go and see a specialist in gastric bypass and weight loss surgeries, is that it is a like it's a year process. It's not something that happens overnight. It's not something that's going to happen next month. They actually put you on a diet for several months. They want to know that you can actually maintain the program once you get the surgery. So they actually will require that you lose a certain amount of weight before they will even consider the surgery. You also have to go through uh, a psychiatric evaluation, counseling, and some other things because it is a lifestyle changing thing. It changes your life forever. So with that said, again, it is, I have two patients who have had it and are doing extremely well. They're doing really great. But I just encourage you to make sure that you have a great conversation with your provider before um, committing to it and make sure that you know all the risks and things that are involved with that. Very good. We have one question coming in that I will just answer for her, and that is, um, does the ADA have any education materials for persons that are Chinese? And I would encourage you to call the 1-800 number 1-800-342-2383 because the ADA does have education materials in multiple different languages. 
Okay, we have time for one more question and two are written in and they are very much the same. So I will ask those. It comes in from both Michelle and Thompson. And the question is, what can be done for high fasting blood sugars in the AM, but normal all day? That's a great question. So when I look at fasting blood sugars, I always look backwards. I all, that's why the journal is so important, and that's why the blood glucose log is so very important. It's like the biggest um, trying to solve a mystery. Why is this? So let's say, for example, your fasting blood sugar is 150 one morning. My first question is, what happened last night? And some questions that I usually ask are, how late did you eat? What did you eat? And what the amounts and what that composition looks like? And did you take your medication the night before if you're taking medication? Those are the three major questions that will give me pause because something happened the night before that caused that blood sugar as fasting to be elevated. So either you ate late, you know, so, and I usually encourage my patients, don't eat a big dinner past seven o'clock. Seven o'clock is the cutoff for me for large dinners. You can have a snack after that. And I usually tell them snacks should consist of like some protein, so like nuts and things like that, or even raw vegetables, if you want to do that um, after seven o'clock. So they don't produce the spikes that you see. If you think about your metabolism kind of on a bell curve, you know, you, your engine gets revved up in the morning, it kind of peaks out in the middle of your day, and then around the middle of the day, the metabolism starts to slow down a little bit. So the last thing you want to do is put a great big heavy meal when your engine is slowing down and can't adequately burn it. So those are some things that I look for. What I would suggest that you do, um, in addition to possibly looking at medication adjustments and things like that, it depends on which medicines you're taking. Um, are you taking them closer to bedtime and that sort of thing? But look at what your diet is doing. Are you eating late? Are you eating very heavy at night? What are you eating? Are you eating fruit late at night? Are you taking your insulin earlier, you know, than you should perhaps, you know, so that it doesn't carry you over through the night? So there are a lot of questions that I would have, particularly with fasting. But those are the three things that I usually look for first. What are your blood sugars doing the night before, before you go to bed? What are you eating the night before and how late are you eating them? Those are some places to start. It's usually we look backwards for fasting and find out what the problem is. And, and back to the exercise piece, people that exercise tend to have a benefit from that up to seven to 24 hours later. So if you do afternoon mm -hmm. exercise, you might see that that really helps with those fasting mornings as well. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, we're wrapping up. Um, you've done a beautiful job, Kim. Could you give us three key takeaway points that you want to make sure that everyone understands when it comes to preventing heart disease? Yes, indeed. First off is um, it's the importance of um, a discussion with your primary care provider. Discussions, ask the questions, make sure that you know your body. You know your body better than anyone, right? And if you think something is wrong, then you pursue it until you can't pursue it anymore. You have to make sure you get your questions answered. That's the first thing. Make sure you ask the questions and trust your instinct and trust your body. The other thing is to make sure that you're eating well, that you have a good balanced diet, implementing great things from the ground and from the trees and from the vines, lean proteins, grilled, baked, or broiled, Use the plate methods, as Dr. Cox mentioned before, manage your diet. And the third thing I want to leave with you is the importance of self-care. Because I tell my patients all the time, where your mind goes, your body follows. If your mind is in a great place, your body's going to respond to your mind. So, you know, don't be ashamed to seek out help if there's a depression issue, because if there's depression or anxiety involved, you're not going to see things very clearly in terms of one, needing to take care of yourself and do prevention work. So take good care of your mind, take good care of your spirit, do things that you enjoy, get a lot of exercise, and just take good care and monitor and keep check on everything. Ask the questions, make sure you know what your labs look like, know your numbers. I know that's probably more than three, but they're probably just in a big old pot, but it's all important. <laughs> No, and I, and I love the idea that you talk about the mind because our attitude has so much to do with how we care for ourselves. So that's a, a, a wonderful tip. I'm glad you brought that in. So consider it's, staying it's online or on the 
or on the phone to complete a short five question survey. Uh, we wanna hear from all of you and it gives us ideas for where we wanna go with some more programs. To help you feel confident about your ability to manage your diabetes and heart health, we encourage you and your loved ones to talk to your doctor, dietitian about your risk, go to knowdiabetesbyheart.org and learn more, register for our next event at diabetes.org forward slash experts, sign up for diabetes education near you, and sign up for ADA's free Living with Type 2 Diabetes program. Links to these are on our website, diabetes.org forward slash experts. Thank you for all the great questions you called and wrote in with. We're sorry we're unable to get to all of them during our live question and answer event. If you have questions about this event, you're welcome to contact us at askada, that's A-S-K-A-D-A, at diabetes.org or by calling 1-800-342-2383. Driving with Diabetes takes a village and we're here to support you. Special thanks to Kimberly Ketter, our expert. I am Carla Cox and on behalf of the ADA team, we want to thank you for joining us today and we look forward to connecting with you at our next Ask the Experts event. March 8th, does kidney disease have to happen? And April 11, spring into action, the link between diabetes management and exercise. And now please stay online for our poll questions. Poll question number one. Overall, how satisfied you with today's events, keeping your heart healthy? Use a scale from one to three with one being not at all satisfied and three being very satisfied. To, refer, to provide your responses, press the corresponding number on your keypad of your phone. For those of you online, please click on the poll section below the Ask a Question form and click to submit your response. Okay, once more on poll question number one. Overall, how satisfied you, were you with today's event, keeping your heart healthy? Use a scale from one to three of one being not at all satisfied and three being very satisfied. Press one for not at all satisfied, two for neither satisfied nor dissatisfied, and press three for very satisfied. While we're taking a moment for the next question to come up, I'd like to remind you about one of our programs supporting people living with diabetes. If you have recently been diagnosed with type two diabetes or could benefit from a refresher, consider signing up for ADA's free program, Living with Type Two Diabetes. Participants receive information via email and e-booklets throughout the year-long program on topics including emotional health, eating healthy, physical fitness, as well as tips on managing and living well with type 2 diabetes. Okay, now on to question number two. Which of the following is the recommended target range for your glucose to help reduce your risk for heart disease? Press 1 for 60 to 180, press 2 for 60 to 150, press 3 for 70 to 180, and press 4 for 80 to 200. That question again, which of the following is recommended target range for your glucose to help reduce your risk for heart disease? Press 1 for 60 to 180, press 2 for 60 to 150, press 3 for 70 to 180, and press 4 for 80 to 200. Before we go on to question three, we would like to let you know that if you missed a part of today's event or would just like to listen again, we now have full recordings available by phone. Call the toll-free number at 866-686-8240 to hear the latest recording. They are also on our website at diabetes.org forward slash experts. Okay, here's question number three. How much moderate intensity physical activity is recommended per week to see health benefits? Press one for at least 30 minutes, and this is per week. Press two for at least 90 minutes. Press three for at least 150 minutes. And press four for none of the above. That question again. How much moderate intensity physical activity is recommended per week to see health benefits? Press one for at least 30 minutes. Press two for at least 90 minutes, press three for at least 150 minutes, and press four for none of the above. Before we move on to the next question, we would like to remind you again that our next Ask the Experts Q&A event will be March 8, 
2022, our expert will be talking about diabetes and kidney disease. To register, go to diabetes.org forward slash experts or contact 1-800-DIABETES, which is 1-800-342-2300. Okay, we have two more questions. Question four, as a result of this event, how likely are you to schedule a visit with your healthcare provider to talk about the link between heart disease and diabetes? Press one for not likely, press two for somewhat likely, and press three for very likely. Once again, question number four, as a result of this event, how likely are you to schedule a visit with your healthcare provider to talk about the link between heart disease and diabetes? Press one for not likely, press two for somewhat likely, and press three for very likely. While we await the final question, remember that a diabetes self-management education and support program will focus on your concerns about diabetes. The program will help to empower you with the knowledge and skills to help you manage your diabetes. A link to find an ADA recognized diabetes education program can be found at the bottom of our Ask the Experts webpage, diabetes.org forward slash experts, or you can speak to a member of our call center at 1-800-342-2383. Okay, our final question. As a result of this event, how likely are you to sign up for or continue to participate in a diabetes self-management education program? Remember, diabetes education programs usually require a referral from a healthcare provider. Press one for not likely, press two for somewhat likely, and press three for very likely. And again, a final question, number five. As a result of this event, how likely are you to sign up for our, or continue to participate in a diabetes self-management education program? Remember, diabetes education programs usually require a referral from a healthcare provider. Press one for not likely, press two for somewhat likely, and press three for very likely. Thank you for staying with us and providing your feedback on today's event. We offer many thanks to our expert, as well as our support vendors and sponsors and No Diabetes by Heart collaboration. This concludes today's program in the Ask the Experts Q&A series. Please check out our website for recordings from this event and additional resources. And lastly, if you have any additional feedback for our team, please stay on the line and leave a message. Thank you and have a good day.